And I've come a long way. I've come from Australia with my wife. Uh, we're here on a holiday and uh, we just saw on the internet that this conference was happening so we decided to book for it and, uh, you know, arrange our travel arrangements uh, around coming to the conference. Uh, actually, no. I believe Philip knows a few of them from other conferences, and uh, so we've been able to get basically the list that we've got. We're really quite lucky. Yeah. That's fantastic. So, what specifically interests you the most in this conference? Any talk that you'll be listening out for? All of them. All of them. Yeah. yeah. Fantastic. Thanks very much for your time. I'm speaking with Philip Gardner now, who was the first speaker at the event today. Would you like to tell us in a little few sentences what your actual talk was about? My talk today was about um, a secret society called the Holy Vamp, which is a German secret society from Westphalia, long, long time ago, which was believed to have um, disappeared. I actually tracked them down and went and met them in the heart of uh, Berlin, um, surrounded by lots of nice Nazi signs and pictures of Hitler. What did you actually find out about them when you went to see them? Well, the, the first, the, the most important thing that to find out is that they actually still exist, because the idea was that they disappeared either in the 16th century or um, just after the Second World War. Um, to me, that didn't quite sound right from other things that I knew, so I contacted people and uh, got in there. Right. So what's the society actually like? Could you give us, tell us what it's actually about? Um, well, originally it was about um, judging people vengeance, if you like, um, but today it's more of a boys club, it's more of a meet up, um, have a drink, uh, reminisce about the good old days when Hitler was on the throne, um, talk about how you know the blonde haired blue eyed boys ought to, uh, like you really, ought to uh, be back in ascendancy, and basically just be very sad like that. Right. So a bit like sort of meek neo-Nazis in other words oh, yes. then? Yes. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. But it's terrifying in its own respect because um, when I met them outside the Berlin Museum, the two men came up in black suits and, uh, and a black Mercedes pulled up and I was taken away in the black Mercedes so it was a real Bond day, it was great. Wow, that's fantastic. It's terrifying, it's not fantastic. Well, it's no, terrifying. an interesting experience for people to hear about at this yes. conference anyway. Yes, yeah. absolutely. Thanks very much for telling us all about it. Thank you very much.
right, um, I'm here to talk about Gobekli Tepe, the oldest temple in the world. So let's see some pictures on it, shall we? This place is in southeast Turkey, which is the Near East, which is also the Garden of Eden, basically, as mentioned in the Bible. And around 9500 BC, at a time when everywhere else was still hunter gathering, um, and the Ice Age was still gripping half of the uh, Northern Hemisphere. So people came along and constructed a series of cult buildings um, at a place called Gobekli Tepe, which means the Hill of the Navel, a uh, navel being uh, a reference to an omphalus or a centre, a cosmic centre on the Earth that perhaps is Mundi. And this is it. As you can see, it's a series of um, subsurface structures with T-shaped pillars, many of which have carvings on them, like this beautiful feline here, uh, this fox there, and many, many other creatures are represented as well, from serpents to lizards, to spiders, to insects, to boar, to all sorts of things. Now, this was constructed, let's get a real time check on this, 9500 BC. That's several thousand years before the construction of the Great Pyramid or Stonehenge, for instance. So, who exactly were these people? How did they tip? What was the function of this place? And other similar places like it, which are found only in southeast Turkey and northern Syria. A land also known to archaeologists as Upper Mesopotamia. Well, the clue seems to be the fact that the Bakhtiteki and the various other sites associated with it are all aligned roughly north and south. Um, there's slight deviations here and there, but all of them seem to have southern entrances and the ritual activity takes place in the north or the northern end. At Gobekli Tepe, the orientation is just slightly off north. And as we know that megalithic structures all around the world subsequently, and I think what's important to point out here is that Gobekli Tepe is essentially the grandfather of all megalithic monuments across the whole of the world. This is the earliest megalithic monument known to man. That these people were looking towards the north for something. They saw death and rebirth associated with the north and the northern sky, as one assumes. If indeed we know that many other megalithic structures built in much later millennia were orientated towards either solar, lunar or stellar events in the calendar year. So, can we find out what the Vecchio Tempe is actually looking at? Well, before we, we do that, it's important to point out that this cult of death and rebirth to do with the early Neolithic and indeed Gobekli Tepe is actually referred to as a pre-pottery Neolithic monument, is that their main cult focused around, as I say, death and rebirth. Um, in particular, the association of the vulture connected with the process of excarnation. This is where the bodies would be put upon wooden structures and left there, and the vulture would peck clean the carcass. The bones would then be collected up and put in what's known as a secondary burial. Now here you can see an image from Çatalhöyük in southern Turkey that shows two of these towers. They represent two different things. The one on the right, you can see this matchstick man without a head. That represents the vulture picking clean the remains. On the left, you can see a head which is actually on the, the, the top of the tower, uh, being cradled or being kept within the influence of the vultures because the vultures were seen to carry the soul to heaven or whatever their concept of heaven or the sky world was seen. And as we know that this has got some connection with the north and the northern skies, then somehow it's possible that the vulture was in some way related to maybe uh, something that was going on in the skies in the north. Well, what's interesting is that many thousands of years after the 
megalithic peoples who constructed these first temples in the world, in the very same area grew up a whole um, uh, race, uh, culture, that was dedicated to a religion associated with the stars. And these were the Sabians, um, and their descendants, uh, the Mandaeans, and also the Yazidi, ancient worshipping peoples of northern Iraq. And all of these peoples had one thing in common, and that is they venerated the north as the direction of the primal cause. It was also the direction of prayer, their Kibbala, um, and it was also the place that they, they believed that you would go to in death in the form of a bird. And rituals were done where birds were released. Sometimes it was a, a, a cock, sometimes it was a dove or a pigeon that were expected to fly towards the northerly place heaven. Okay, now yeah, Craig showed you similar imagery uh, before relating to the importance of the north. Obviously, we know that the stars revolve around the north pole, or the northern celestial pole, and that this is marked today by the star Polaris. And it is a fact that the Sabians, the Mandaeans, the Yazidi all venerate the North Star. But the thing is, is that if they inherited their beliefs from a much older megalithic culture that was in the, the same area as them, thousands of years beforehand, then clearly they wouldn't have been venerating Polaris. But what's interesting is that in ancient Greek tradition, Cygnus was also known as the flying vulture, or the falling vulture. And once I realised this, I realised that we may actually have the direction and the stars that may have been, interest, uh, that may have been of interest to these people at the Beckham back in 9500 BC. Could it be that they saw the stars of Cygnus as in some way representative of the celestial vulture that carries the soul to the northerly place heaven. Okay, right here is the image that is familiar to us today of uh, Cygnus. Cygnus is also known as the Northern Cross and it was known as the Greater Cross in Christian tradition from at least the 6th century and almost certainly this is a tradition that goes back to the time of Constantine now, what is tied in very importantly with the association with Cygnus uh, in its form of, of, of the swan in other parts of the world, in Asia and, and, and Europe, is the fact that it was seen as the ultimate point at the top of something that was known in shamanic tradition as the sky pole. Here you can see uh, Tungus Rainier's shaman's representation of the sky pole with the cosmic axis at the top being represented by the swan, uh, showing once again that the swan was considered, that almost certainly the celestial counterpart Cygnus was seen to be the point of termination between this world and the next world, the point of entry and exit into the sky world. Now, what's so interesting is that if this was um, a belief, a practice, rituals were uh, focused around this in places like the Vatican Tepe, in Southeast Turkey as early as 9500 BC, then why did they venerate the, you know, the, 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 the stars of Cygnus at this time? And what's interesting is that Deneb, the brightest star in Cygnus, had actually been pole star between 15 and 16,000 BC. Um, and even after that, for 2,000 years, another star in the constellation of Cygnus, which is um, Delta Cygni, was also a pole star for another 2,000 years. So from 16 to 30,000 years, the stars of Cygnus were at the top of the pole. And basically what I began to understand was that this belief in the sky pole, the cosmic axis, um, and its associations with the idea of a world tree linking heaven to earth, which we'll talk about shortly, probably went back to around 15,000, 16,000 BC, to the Paleolithic age. In other words, the peoples of the Bekli Tepe were 
holding onto a belief that was already maybe 6,000 years old. So what it was that the sickness seemed to have become so important to these people. Well, just to fill in, Vulture Near East connected with sickness, I'm pretty certain. In Asia and Europe, where the vulture was obviously not an indigenous bird, another bird had to take its place, and this was the swan. And the reason why the swan became so important and so associated with a northerly place ever is because of its migrations. Each year it goes, it comes from and goes back to its migrate, um, its um, place breeding grounds in the Arctic in the north. And traditions across Europe and Asia talk about swans carrying the souls of the dead to a northerly place heaven. North beyond the north wind is one term that was used. Um, and this is a universal tradition. And what's important about it is that in many areas, Cygnus, the stars of, would have been certain power. In other words, they would always have been seen in the northerly part of the heaven. So these birds were seen to be flying towards the heaven, a heaven that was actually represented by these stars. Now, in North America also, we find whole association with sickness. Here is an image known as the, um, the, the wolf trail um, in Blackfoot tradition in the area around the Rocky Mountains of Montana. And this is a representation of the Milky Way, which you can see here right, which is the other important component with sickness, because sickness is placed in the most northerly parts of the Milky Way which has been universally seen as the road or the river to the sky road. Um, and where sickness is placed is exactly where the, where the Milky Way breaks into two and forms like a, a, a dark river down its centre known as the Great Rift or the Dark Rift. It's just gaseous matter that forms a dark area. Um, and what I can show is that this image, of the, this abstract image of the Milky Way which the Blackfoot called the Wolf Trail, actually shows the northern celestial star, uh, sorry, the northern uh, celestial pole in the centre where this cross is, um, and that it actually represents what was known in Native American tradition as the bird foot or turkey foot constellation, um, which has been identified as sickness. This is found amongst various North American tribes. But what's also important is that Cygnus was also known as the cross star. Um, and that, I think, you, 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 you know, is represented on the wolf trail that we saw before. Um, and what's important about stuff turning up in America is that it shows very strongly that these pale beliefs almost certainly entered North America from, from Asia before the end of the last ice age, when the bridge between uh, Siberia um, and Alaska was finally um, taken up during the waters of rising after the end of the last ice age. Um, I looked into Native American mound culture and we find sickness important here. A place called Great Circle, um, which you can see here, which is at Newark in Ohio. Uh, the Homeworld peoples around 100 BC constructed this monument. It's aligned perfectly with the summer solstice, sunrise, and this is marked by a mound in the dead centre known as Eagle Mound, and this looks out towards that entrance exit, and just two hours before sunrise, um, in 100 BC, the Milky Way would have been perpendicular through that exact spot, um, going up um, into the, um, the, the point where signals would have been overhead, that is a representation of the turkey foot or the bird foot symbol, which, as we know, is Cygnus. And other archaic astronomers have associated bird effigy mounds uh, of the Hopewell uh, in various states of, of the USA with Cygnus. So why is Cygnus so important? We come to the Maya, we find Cygnus important here. The, um, the bird of creation known as Seven Macaw on the top of their world tree, which represents the Milky Way, down to the point where the sun passed over the ecliptic, which is just lying down the bottom where there's a serpent, can be identified as sickness. Um, 
And in the Inca culture, centered around the, 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 um, the area of Peru, the main cult center of uh, Cusco, which was seen as the center focus of, of the kingdom, um, is laid out on the ground in the shape of a puma. This puma has recently been identified um, not only as the axis mundi, the, 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 the link to the cosmic axis um, in Incan tradition, but Italian archaeoastronomer and, and astrophysicist Guido Magli has identified that puma as represented by the dark cloud region in the exact vicinity of Cygnus. Cygnus was seen as the point of entry and exit into the sky world of the Incan people. Okay, it, Cygnus is found all over the American continent, but what about closer to home? Avery, a place we probably all know very well. The central axis is defined by the two inner circles uh, and a third plan circle beyond those, and also a marker stone, a hole in it, which used to be positioned behind the second circle. It is aligned perfectly to the setting of Deneb, the brightest star in Cygnus, um, for a date of between 3000 to 2500 BC. This, this alignment was first identified in the 1960s by Alexander Tom, the great granddaddy of uh, archaeoastronomer. What's also interesting is that the only carving to be found at Avery is of a swan's head and neck, which you can see represented here, not very well I'm afraid, um, which is on stone 25S in the Kennet Avenue. Um, you can clearly see that it is shaped like a swan. Um, if we go to Waylon Smithy, just um, you know, a few, few tens of miles away from Avery, all part of the same Wessex culture, um, that would have been initially responsible for the construction of the first megalithic monuments, we find that this too, um, sideways on, is aligned to the setting of Deneb, the brightest star in Cygnus. There are other alignments as well, but the person who discovered this was Professor John North, um, who made uh, a study of Wessex culture and its alignments to stars in a book called Stonehenge and other neolithic monuments. Um, and he commenting on, on the repeated um, fact that uh, Deneb um, in Cygnus kept coming up in these alignments, probably more than, than any other star. But what's also important about Wayland Smith is it's also associated with swan lore through its connection with Wayland, who took the form of a swan to escape from an evil king who had kept him laying in this um, um, smith, um, divine, which is why he's known as the divine smithy. In Newgrange, in Ireland, we find uh, the work of Anthony Murphy and Richard Moore, two Earth Mysteries researchers over there, um, in, on their site, mythicalisland.com. Um, they have shown conclusively that Newgrange is, is laid out in the shape of uh, the stars of Cygnus, um, and that the famous alignment towards the mid-winter sunrise if continued on, takes you to a lesser passage grave known as Four Knox, which is aligned to the rising of Deneb in Cygnus. A Kalanish in the Isle of Lewis, somewhere that's been much looked at as far as alignments, um, can be shown to be aligned. The Northern Avenue is aligned perfectly to the rising of Sadar, which is the centre of the cross in, in Cygnus. And this is also associated with legends associated with a bird man who came and erected this uh, site originally. Okay, so Cygnus is important amongst the megalithic culture. There are many other sites as well um, to do with the British megalithic um, sites that Professor John North identified as associated with Denim and Cygnus. But if we go to Egypt now, we find the pattern repeated there. Um, Cygnus is generally uh, associated with the falcon-headed god, um, which is seen in, um, in, in celestial maps of the heavens, um, and it's got an, an, an un unpronounceable name, but is directly linked with two falcon-headed gods, one of which is Sokar, the other one is Horus. Both of these are associated with northern skies with this falcon-headed god, which you can see here. Um, stabbing a 
Gaul, which actually represents First Major, which is the sparring partner of Cygnus in various traditions around the world, in North America, um, amongst the Olmec, amongst the Maya, um, and others included. Now, if we go to Giza, there is an awful lot of mysteries of Giza, but it's a fact that if you stand on the plateau of Giza, um, and if you were there between um, around 2600 BC when the, the first pyramids were constructed there, Deneb, the brightest star in Cygnus, rises in exactly in line with Heliopolis, the ancient pulse centre associated with the Phoenix, which is another symbol of Cygnus um, in Egyptian mythology. Um, not only that, but Deneb set in exact orientation to the position of the three pyramids on the, on the plateau. Not only that, but I, 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 I throw this in um, for your perusal, but it is a fact that if you align the three cross stars of Cygnus over the three pyramids, they align better than the stars of Orion, as proposed by one of my colleagues, as you know full well. Actually, you can see this here. The red stars are actually from a star, a proper photograph, and this has been checked, double checked, triple checked. Um, you can see that the three red stars over the three pyramids, which represent the cross stars of, of, of Cygnus, are actually better aligned than those of Orion. So you get how that one's off as far as Orion? Now, it could all be coincidence, but if it is coincidence, then what does it say about the Orion mystery? Cygnus is also the subject of the work of, of Dr. Ronald Wells, an Egyptologist, who identified it as extremely important to do with cosmic birth um, and death, to do with the whole solar cycle in Egyptian tradition, the idea that the sun is swallowed by the goddess Nuit at the end of the night and reborn again the next morning, you know, as out of her. Um, in this image where you can see Nuit overlaid um, on the Milky Way, which he identified and saw as a visual representation of, of uh, Nuit, the sky goddess, um, what he pointed out is that the stars of Cygnus fall in the, the precise area of her reproductive organs um, and uterus, and that it was associated with, with cosmic life and death. In Cygnus, is pointing directly at us. The largest gun barrel in the universe, oh, sorry, the galaxy, is pointing directly at you and I. Which is why these strange particles, which hit the Earth with so much power that they penetrate, not just through the atmosphere, which is where most of them are caught and destroyed, but penetrates through the ground, deep down into caves, half a mile deep. Now, is it a possibility that our ancestors were in some way affected by this or some way became aware of this? Well, in the knowledge of uh, right the way through to around 14,000 BC, there was almost double the amount of cosmic rays hitting the Earth. And this is shown in um, ice core samples that have come out from, uh, from Antarctica and also Greenland up in the north. Now, what I began to wonder is, I wonder if these cosmic rays, obviously, hitting the atmosphere, cosmic Earth, were, were coming at that time from Cygnus X3. Yeah, could this have been the source of cosmic rays? Cygnus X3, by the way, was the first place identified as a point source of cosmic rays. You know, there are various other possible places, but this was certainly the first place identified as that. Is it possible that these rays were somehow affecting people's heads, affecting their minds, affecting human behaviour, maybe even affecting human evolution through mutations? Now this was the theory that I was you know, about to go with in, in my book, The Sickness Mystery, when suddenly I found that an American scientific th think tank, ex-key um, members of the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, JPL, associated with NASA, just last year, came out with exactly the same idea. Um, Aidan Minor, the head of the Minor Institute of Las Vegas, um, and his team um, are now 
basically proposing scientifically that cosmic rays affected the Paleolithic mindset. But what they say is it was a slightly earlier date, read between about 35 to 40,000 years ago, because they've identified another peak of cosmic ray activity. The other thing is, is that, um, and by the way, obviously what's important about that earlier phase is that that's when the cave art and human behaviour of modern humans changed dramatically. This was when the first cave art was, was, was done for the first time, like for instance this cave at Wesleyan Chauvet, uh, again in southern France, dates to the earliest around 32,000. This is the oldest and most, sort of most beautiful cave art that we know. Suddenly all this began. Suddenly a lot of things changed in the human mindset. Could this also have been connected with human race? I've heard cosmic rays. Cosmic rays the cosmic rays have been affecting us at different points all the way through human evolution. And could the point source of them be sickness? Well, not according to the minerals. After having looked in sickness for a point source of cosmic rays, because they realised through analysis of all the brilliant gen data that they must be coming from somewhere up in the northern skies, they overlooked sickness X-ray completely, which is basically um, a, a huge oversight from their point of view. So they started looking next door in the constellation of Draco and focused their attentions on a planetary nebula, a possibly binary um, system known as the Cat's Eye. And they believe that the cosmic rays are coming from there, but the top theorists in the world on planetary nebula who I've consulted say that this is just not on, and that there is no evidence at all of cosmic rays coming from the cat's eye. But the Minos continue to claim that the cat's eye and, and is the source of the cosmic rays, whereas I obviously am associated with Cygnus X3, although they are now seriously interested in Cygnus X3, the battle has commenced. goes right back further in my estimation to pre-ice age. The skin boats were a shallow draft and they um, used rivers as roads because it did not need roads and there was no aircraft, nothing that we know today. So the easiest way to travel around was that. The distribution was right across Europe of such as the Venus figurines, which uh, a lot of people believe is the Earth Mother. Dated back as far as 2000 BC. They also had um, uh, um, tiny beads made out of mammoth tusks and so forth. And they were found in the south of France, and they were found up in Scotland and across in the Baltic regions. So, what these people were doing was, in fact, using this mode of transport, if you like, to follow the herds, to follow the seasons. So, they travelled by the stars. Now, travelling in astro navigation requires the measurement of angles. And that means measuring the stars, the sun, the moon, the earth, and understanding what local time was. So, what they did is they created wheels of the stars. They divided those wheels by using animism, if you like, smart, and giving each selection of stars a name. But they came across one image which is very important to us that they put in the sky, which we call the serpent of time, serpent of wisdom. And it's across the whole world. The Aztecs have it, the Anastasi Indians have it, the Alchemists use it, the Japanese, the Chinese, everywhere it's dragons and serpents. So why is that? 
Well, there's, there's a moon clock in the sky, which I don't know how many of you have noticed to take the time to sit down and look at the northern sky for all the night. But in it, it's a shape that's like a serpent. And right in the center of the serpent, the little cross is, that's the North Pole of the Sun. They called, the Egyptians called them the imperishable ones because they never set all of the horizon. And horizon meaning to them as it means to us, place of time. And they never set, so they saw them as imperishable and they didn't die. But you look at the bottom, there's three pyramids, and that's the view looking north. So that's what they saw. But it moves. As the earth spin, it moves. So they created a clock. And if you know what the degrees are in the sky, and you know that constellation, you can tell the time. So do you think that's important? It's about survival, that's it. But they also made a calendar. Because as you may or may not know, in 365 degrees in a year, one 24-hour period is roughly one degree, slightly less than that. So, if you start at the solstice last year, at midnight, the serpent's head pointed directly north. And the next day, it will be one degree round. And the following, another degree. And as long as you know what its position is, you know what day of the year it is. So they could go through Then they combined um, two wheels, the one in the North Pole and the one around the middle of the Earth. Often people get confused with the idea of Ezekiel's wheels, of creatures that spin around, of what they think is an alien spacecraft that rises up high into the heavens and comes back down again. But in fact, the serpent does that every night. And the wheel of animals that are around it are exactly what was described to Ezekiel by the Pharaoh. at 32,000 BC and the methods that he used which have been lost and in fact symbology around this hall here is called the King's Hall which stands for ruler or measurer uh, um, that's what a, a king is and it's even um, manifest outside with the cross that you have on the wall okay so what I'm going to talk about is techniques of measuring nature that the ancients used um, up to about 4,000 years ago and how it's in the pyramids so we're, when you're talking about 4,000 years ago, so during the Bronze Age, what signs were there in this country? Was there any? Yes, there was. Um, 1300 BC, we, we have in this country and in Norway and Scandinavia, signs of crosses and ships and the methods of navigation. So you're talking about things like how Kalanish is built in a cross shape or is it? Yes, I am. Yes. Absolutely. <laughs> and that's there too. Absolutely. And um, also that they left the symbology of the power of the sun, how it creates the seasons and how it affects life and death. And so is that sort of like how during the Neolithic and Bronze Age you had a lot of circular objects like stone circles, hinges? Yes, that's absolutely right. Yeah, and, and it's all about what the ancients would call the knowledge of wheels, the wheels of the stars, the wheels of the seasons. But the issue is that we've not known until 1997 how to actually measure them, how they actually measured the angles and made the zodiacs and told the time and then created a system of measurement to avoid chaos if you like by creating order or a balance out of order and it became a philosophy if you like it really ended i suppose with the pyramids themselves and various sites around the world which closed down civilizations disappeared and then became a mishmash and, and it leads to where we are today I was just going to say, does this actually happen all at the same time or is it sort of more dispersed yes, around? It, it happened at the, age, uh, at the end of the age of Taurus, at the beginning of the age of Aries, okay, which uh, in um, Egyptian terms is Amen or Amun, um, so they have the pre-
your talk is on cracking the symbol code. Could you expand on that a little bit and tell us what it's about, please? Yes, well, as Hamish Muller and the other speakers have mentioned, people have been reaching for signs of supreme intelligence, or mighty God, call it what you will, the universe, for a very long time. And this goes back, the use of symbolism in that search goes back to the very earliest days, back to 20,000 years BC, and the earliest symbols we have of the sacred nature were found in the caves of Lescar in France, and further discoveries nearby at Les Trois Frères at Ariège show that they were shamanistic, they were a means of reaching for spiritual power, knowledge and understanding of the universe that lay beyond the temporal world. And this search has continued throughout mankind's history. And the talk I should be giving this morning runs it from Lescar through ancient Egypt into biblical Israel and then on into Christianity. And within the Christian context we'll be displaying the hidden symbolism that lies within certain parts of church art, symbolism that teaches a very different message from Jesus the prophet, Jesus the Nazarene. A message that says he came to reveal and not to redeem. And what he came to reveal is a spiritual pathway that has been followed since time immemorial. It became popular in the Middle Ages under the title of the search for the Holy Grail. And then, of course, with the Renaissance and the change of patronage of art from the church to the wealthy merchants, this type of symbolism became encoded in uh, Renaissance paintings. And I shall be using examples of Leonardo's work to show the truly heretical nature of the symbolism in that, and also to refute the nonsense that has been promulgated in the Da Vinci Code, the Holy Blood yeah. and the Holy Grail and all that titty for and bullshit, let's be blunt. But it's nonsense that has had a spin-off effect on every author working in this field. Because the Holy Blood and the Holy Grail, flawed and all as it is, turned a trickle of interest into a tidal wave. And of course with the Da Vinci Code selling 40 million copies, my book sales have gone through the roof. So flawed and all as those works might be, they've done us all an enormous favor. And what they really prove is there's a great thirst for knowledge out there amongst the general public that nobody ever realized before. And this is what we're trying to tap into. And the agenda is very, very simple. Yes, it's to sell books, I need to make a living, but it's a much more important one. It's to encourage people to go out and search for themselves, not take things for granted, handed down by church or state, but go out and ask questions. Go out and visit sacred sites, be they Neolithic, be they medieval, it doesn't matter. Go and experience it. That's what it's all about. Fantastic. Thanks very much. It's wonderful. He said it was far more to it than that. It's a coded guide into a system of initiation. And he cited a quotation from the Gospel of Thomas, where he quoted Jesus as saying, He who drinks from my mouth, I shall become he, and he shall become me, which according to Campbell, and in my humble opinion also, is the whole point of the search for the Holy Ground. It doesn't matter what our starting point is. An interest in earth energies, an interest in the earth and science, medieval architecture and art, they disquiet without organized religion. We are on a search that is quite literally as old as mankind itself. And because the fruits of that search come from understanding rather than from knowledge, symbolism which was used to convey it from the very beginning it's not there to be explained. It's there to be experienced. Because it will bring about a shift in consciousness so you'll suddenly realize you're beginning to understand connections between the spiritual world and the world we inhabit that are absolutely incommunicable with words. Now, according to Colin Wilson, amongst all peoples, there was a small minority which he called the few. People who knew they had spiritual powers and sought means to enhance them for the benefit of all. 
And this is the subject of this painting. Something that appears on American symbolism. The usually in the middle of a triangle on a banknote is the ancient Egyptian symbol of the Eye of Horus, which was traditionally painted on the bows of boats flying the river Nile on an Egyptian seafaring vessels. Then when we come to Israel, most of the symbolism there, as I have mentioned, was literary, because they deplored graven images. But one that has come down to us is the Mother David, or the Seal of Solomon. Two triangles interlinked, displaying the ancient phonetic idea of as above, also so below. The cross is a particular shape. It is a temple cross, and it's a very specific one. It's known as the Croix Celeste, or the Croix de Connaissance Universelle, the cross of universal Gnostic knowledge. And in the church's eyes, is it extremely heretical. So what's it doing on the West Front, one of Europe's most major cathedrals? Well, first of all, it's a, a sly indication of where the money came from to build that cathedral. The cathedral was built and financed by the Knights Templar. But it's also one of the triggers we find to alert us that there are hidden messages here. Now, when you get one such trigger, you start to become aware. If you find two or more, then you know, without any doubt whatsoever, but the correct way to interpret the carvings is not the orthodox mainstream Christian one, but the heretical one. And now we come to the crunch. The most frequently reproduced picture, I think, in the world. You find it on table mats, walls of church halls, people's sitting rooms, calendars, and nobody has ever really looked at it. Now, all paintings are a series of lies trying to convey a great truth. You're trying to convey in two dimensions what is going on in three, and here maybe even in four. All Jewish ritual meals take place at the same time of day, after dusk. Look at the back window, please. It's broad daylight. Now, according to the contract, which we still have, this painting was supposed to depict the Last Supper at the point where Jesus says, one among you will betray me. And the story goes on to relate in the Gospel that Jesus said, the Son said, Who is it, Lord? And he said, He who puts his salt into the bowl along with me and with Judas and me dips some bread in a bowl of wine. The problem is, there is no bowl of wine within reaching distance of Jesus or Judas. So it isn't that. And yet, if you look at the people around Jesus, they're all in a state of some agitation. But Jesus is sitting there, extremely calm, the sort of eye of the storm. So something's going on. Well, it ain't the institution of communion. At the other end of the hall, fate diametrically facing this painting, is a painting by Donatello of the Crucifixion. And the theological link between the two events would be, drink this in memory of me, this is my blood, here is my body which is broken for you, and all the rest of it. Yet there isn't broken bread on the table. There isn't anything remotely resembling a chance. So the question I would ask is, is the better version about a totally different question? Is it about who is going to lead us after you are gone, Master? Now, according to church tradition, 
the person who is supposed to lead them after Jesus is gone is St. Peter. The bearded figure next to the rather effeminate figure of John. Just there, there is a disembodied hand with a knife, which can only be Peter's. And it's as though Peter is saying to John, it's not me, God, it's him. And the knife is pointing at the figure of James the Righteous, who the Acts of the Apostles describe as the first bishop of Jerusalem. So here you would have a heresy refusing the power base of Rome, which is the Petrine Foundation. Now much fun has been made by Benjamin B. Lincoln in claiming that the effeminate figure of St. John is actually Mary Magdalene. I'd like to confirm that, but I'm afraid it's our nonsense. John is deliberately painted in a, an effeminate, almost asexual manner as a hermaphrodite. Because that, at that particular time, if any of these people had done their research into symbolism at the time, was the symbol for somebody who would achieve the perfect state of initiation. The highest state of initiation one can have, the perfect blend between the yin and the yang. In other words, it is back to the old, old business of Jesus came to reveal rather than to redeem. Sadly, with the lighting in here, I can see this beautifully on the screen. I don't think you can see a damn thing from where you are. But it does just show you the effeminate nature of the Apostle John and Peter with the disembodied hand. Now, according to Rudolf Steiner, symbolism can be defined or can be understood in anything up to nine different levels, depending on the level of spiritual development of the viewer. I can stand here all day and give you explanations for this, that, or the other. And frankly, it would be meaningless. Because symbolism is not there to be explained. It is there to be experienced. Since I got this Ross and Guardian of the Secrets of the Holy Grail, I've had a flood of letters from people over the last seven years, some of whom have crossed the Atlantic, to recreate that pilgrimage. They have all gone to the same seven sites, they have all seen the same symbols, and they have all reported transformative experiences. But what validates their reports for me is those experiences are all different. And they occur at different times and at different places. You see, the medieval master masons and the ancients knew how to encode stuff into symbolism that can reach us at a level that is subconscious and very profound. They were largely created by people in a different state of consciousness. And if we approach them in a prayerful and meditative state, we too will undergo a shift of consciousness and our whole understanding will change. Now in my innocence and naivety when I first came into this business, I thought the seven stages of initiation that information and knowledge was revealed to you by your teacher at each stage. The very reverse is the case. You are awarded a level of initiation because your ability to understand and to draw from within yourself and from the spiritual world has increased to the requisite level. Everybody is different. Our understanding of the sublime spiritual reality of the world we live in is different. But ultimately, we have to live in the real world whether there is commerce, whether there is violence, whether there is destruction of the earth. Now many years ago I went to a talk by Quentin Chris and he took questions that were submitted in writing at the end. And at the end he got the most important question of all. And he looked at the little piece of paper with some puzzlement. 
And then he spoke. He said, so you want the world to be better, do you, dear? Well, it's only waiting for the priests and the politicians to make it better for you. They've been around for thousands of years and got a bloody mess for them. If you want the world to be better, the answer is very simple. Go out there and be better. And the universal spiritual principles of brotherhood, justice, and truth lie at the heart of the Grail Search and every other spiritual search that is recorded at Rossland Chapel. Those teachings have come to us from as far back as ancient Egypt, if not beyond, been handed down from pupil to initiate down through the ages, and they're still there for us to benefit from. But it's down to you. I can't give you this. You need to go and look and experience for yourself. Thank you very much. You've been looking at evidence of Jesus in the Dead Sea Scrolls. Can you tell us what you've uncovered? Well, the first of the Dead Sea Scrolls was discovered in 1947 in a cave near to Qumran, which is on the northwest coast of the Dead Sea. And from the earliest uh, appearance of the scrolls, people speculated, people like Dupont Sommer, Ian Wilson, John Allegro, uh, that there was a prefiguration of Jesus, or potentially, in some of the scrolls. Um, that was elaborated by John Allegro, who was really taken to task by his fellow uh, translators and the Ecole Biblique team. And I think now it's probably fair to say that there is no mention of Jesus in the Dead Sea Scrolls. But there is feedback in the other direction. I think it's almost certain that the New Testament version of this religious experience, unedited by, pre, by following uh, editors, um, did draw heavily on the Dead Sea Scrolls. So in the New Testament, particularly in Paul, who's probably the earliest writer uh, of the events of Jesus' uh, life and his, his, uh, his um, death, uh, perhaps 30 years after um, his crucifixion. He shows the strongest evidence for drawing on the Dead Sea Scroll material. So these were written around 2,000 years ago, were they then the Dead Sea Scrolls? No. <laughs> <laughs> Some of them, yes. I mean, <laughs> it's, it, broadly speaking, they fall into three groups. There are the biblical texts, some of which go back maybe three, 400 BC. The, the material that the Qumran Essenes brought to their community around about 150 BC, which is 2,000. 150 years ago. They did write some 2,000 years ago, absolutely true, but they also collected and had in their possession material from much older periods. So, years ago at least from the Dead Sea Scrolls. So three different sort of groups of, of material. So that you said the third step were apocalyptic, did you say? Apo apocrypha. So what, what does that mean? Because I'm sorry, I don't know what that means. It means they were um, known at the time, but when it came to putting together the New Testament, they were left out. 
Right, I understand. So the very, very, in, well, invaluable resources for understanding how the people lived at that time. So then. You could classify some of the Nag Hammadi, the, uh, um, the Gnostic Gospels, as being apocryphal. They were known about, and we have, we have examples of them now, but they didn't get into the, into the main New Testament, into the Bible. That's fascinating, absolutely fruitful research you've done there then as well. And you published two books as well, have you as well? Yeah, the first one, the first one is on the, the Copper Scroll, really, one of the Dead Sea Scrolls. Um, it's, it's really basically about a very strange material that uh, all the other scrolls were written on papyrus or leather, um, uh, parchment, but one, one single scroll was written on copper and it was engraved, certainly around about your 2,000 years ago, I think that's probably right, but it contains material that clearly dates to a much, much earlier period, perhaps eight or 900 years before, or even earlier. Uh, and being a metallurgist by training, the fact that they were writing on a, a metal just, just absolutely intrigued me, and I had, to, I had to find out why. And that's what led me into it, and it turned out to be really a treasure map 64 locations where treasure had been hidden uh, with quite precise descriptions go to such and such a place go x cubits from that place dig down y cubits and you'll find z talents of gold or silver or jewelry has any of this actually been found and uncovered until i started my research no from 1952 right the way through 1953 right the way through to when i started working on it no one had actually found any of the treasure but I did, as a result of my work, uh, identify quite a, a, a large number of the items and have held some of them in my hand. So that led me on to other things. That led me to analyze why they knew uh, the things they were writing about, not only in the Copper Scroll, but in, in other texts, in other scrolls. It's certainly an accomplishment. Well, thank you very much for your time and enjoy the rest of your day as well. Thank you. Thank you. is called The Real X-Files. Would you like to explain to us what that's going to entail? Sure. I used to run the British government's UFO project and I made a promise that uh, it would be quite interesting to do a talk without talking about UFOs. Um, but all the other weird and wonderful things that came my way because I ran the UFO project, so crop circles, animal mutilations, uh, remote viewing, because if you find yourself running a UFO project for government, anything weird that happens, it will come your way. So is this all that's actually happened in Britain, all these strange events? Have actually been yes, I'm going to be talking exclusively about things that have happened in the UK that I've investigated personally. So is there anything really interesting that you can tell us, just a little taste of your talk before we actually start? Well, having promised not to talk about UFOs, of course I am going to slip in some UFO material. How could I not? Um, what I'm going to talk about um, is the recent release by the Ministry of Defence of the most highly classified UFO report ever published in this country. Right, well I'm just going to ask you one question that you probably wouldn't have hit before, but is there any truth to the X-Files? The X-Files actually, I think, have done their research very carefully. Um, when you see UFOs on the X-Files, um, those are the same sort of shapes and characteristics in terms of flight and manoeuvre uh, that have been reported by many UFO witnesses. When you see the entities, again, same thing. So they've gone out, they've done their research in the uh, world of the paranormal. Um, so if it's based on uh, truth, I'm not sure. It's certainly based on, on what the witnesses think is the truth. Well, that's excellent. I can't wait for you to talk. It's actually uh, unidentified aerial phenomena in the United Kingdom air defence region. But that's a bit of a mouthful. Um, so the media will just call it that UFO report. Um, but it's hugely significant because it is the most highly classified document the MOD has released on this subject. It was um, classified at the time secret UK eyes only. Predominantly, I have to say, because of the technical information there about the capabilities of various radar systems. Because, of course, um, one of the most important parts of 
of any government UFO project is actually to drill down into the, the military reports and the reports from pilots. And particularly the reports where you've got official scientists backed up by radar events. So that you're dealing with more than just a story. And there are all sorts of interesting UFO stories that you can hear out here. But um, when you see that backed up with uh, some radar events, um, that I think takes it in terms of the evidence to a, to a higher level. And it means even skeptics uh, will occasionally sit up and pay attention. Then um, the report has an anonymous author. And um, I, I should just say it's not to me. Um, I ran the UFO project from 91 through to 94. This report was more recent. Um, it actually was produced um, between 96 and 99. Um, it took quite some time to write. But uh, I was actually involved in setting up the report. And I'll, I'll just tell this little anecdote because I think it's, it's quite funny and it shows sometimes the dramatic tensions that exist in government on this subject. That there's always been a sort of skeptic versus believer. Debate raging at the heart of the establishment about the UFO phenomenon. And actually, if you look back, you can find some very senior figures, um, some of the great establishment figures of the uh, Second World War and post war figure uh, uh, period, people like um, Lord Dowding, people like Earl Manbach, um, great scientists like Sir Henry Tizard and R.V. Jones. Um, uh, they've, they've all taken a view on the UFO phenomenon. They've all been asked to take that view um, because of the fact that UFOs are being seen by infamous pilots and things. And they fall into the category of either being um, complete skeptics or out and out believers in a sort of exotic, possibly even extraterrestrial um, uh, aspect. This. In 1993, halfway through my duty on that project, uh, I was discussing this with um, my opposite number in the defence intelligence staff. We decided that we needed to do an in-depth study into all this. We, we decided we'd been in the UFO business since 1950. That's when the British government's UFO project was set up. But frankly, we weren't a step. All we knew was that most UFOs could be explained. Uh, some UFOs apparently were capable of speeds and maneuvers way ahead of anything that we got, uh, but we didn't know what they were. So we thought, let's do a study. But um, to do a study, we had to convince both the um, uh, accountants to actually fund this sort of stuff. I mean, why should we fund the study into UFOs when we need to buy um, kit? For our troops. Um, and why should we fund a study into UFOs with marketing in the department? Think there's no such thing. Why don't you waste time really studying something that doesn't exist? They would say. So we decided on a very clever trick. Um, and it was a very simple trick. We simply banned the use of the word UFO in all of this. So whenever we went to do a briefing, we talked about unidentified aerial phenomena. UAPs, and um, we'd get halfway through a briefing, and people wouldn't know what a UAP was, and then we started talking about the characteristics of UAPs, their flight parameters, the aerodynamics, um, the propulsion system, um, and we used vague phrases like these people to discuss who or what the occupants were. So we could get totally through a briefing, and I went to one with my box, it was a and we got through the entire briefing and we were shown photographs, we were shown all sorts of things. And as we were walking out the building back to our own, he turned to me and shook his head and said, Oh, that was an interesting briefing. I said, Yeah. And he said, Well, it's just been one thing that was uh, bothering me was why throughout the entire presentation did he keep referring to these people? He said, Who are these people? Why did he keep waving his finger around and doing that? And 
And this was an official briefing. So we bang into the phrase UFO, and uh, if you go onto the website, and if you access this, uh, this wonderful 464 page uh, system, <coughs> which we've split into lots of helpful small bits, otherwise it will crash your computer. Um, you'll go an awful long way through those 464 pages without seeing the word UFO anywhere in it. And yet that's what the whole thing's about. So sometimes the government works in mysterious ways. And um, at the end of the presentation, so I'll throw in a couple of cases. But I, I really want, because that's what it uh, says in the program, I really do want to talk about some of the other stuff apart from the UFOs. Um, the title of the talk is The Real X Files. And as I mentioned, the, the reason for that is that if anything weird happens and you have a UFO project, guess where it's going to go? So all these sorts of weird and wonderful things um, pass through games. Despite being billed as The Real X Files, I don't think I'm, I don't consider myself the real Fox Mulder. Um, although my agents and my publishers say, no, come on, that's exactly what we want. Um, but still, when I was doing that particular job, um, although the X-Files was, was running and there were some similarities, I, I didn't have scope with me. So that was a, a great source of, of disappointment to me. But one of the weird and wonderful things that we occasionally were drawn into is the debate about crop circles. And I thought it, it was interesting seeing in, um, the, the earlier presentation about some of the symbology of crop circles. The Ministry of Defence got dragged into this debate in, in a rather more um, amusing but fundamentally mundane way. Um, there was a, a colonel at um, the Army Air Corps base at Middle Royal who one morning picked up the phone and had an angry farmer shout down the phone and at him. What the hell are you guys doing flying your helicopters over my fields, making these stupid patterns? Um, you're ruining my crops, he said. You know, try and explain yourself. So the army went out, and uh, this was in 1985. They uh, flew over the fields, they took some photos of these things. What the farmer heard <coughs> was that the, the helicopters were, were somehow hovering very low over the ground and swirling these, these, at the time, very simple circles um, in his fields. Now, many farmers give the military the uh, permission to exercise on their land. So the military is understandably keen to keep farmers uh, on the side. So the last thing we want is the suggestion that we're going around damaging their crops. So what, what we did is, um, uh, I think, uh, just to sort of prove that you couldn't do it, um, hovered over and of course in the swirl there'll be a downwash from the helicopter. But we showed that there was no way we could actually make a crop circle. I think the helicopter would have to be upside down to actually do that. Um, but the report on this was produced and they simply didn't know what to do with it. So uh, they sent it to my, one of my predecessors of the UFO project and they said that we have no idea what this is all about. It's a mystery. But um, you guys who have a UFO project, maybe you can make some sense of it. And, and at least explain to the farmer uh, that it's not us, it's not our helicopters. So at that time, because it was known that the Ministry of Defence and the Army was taking an interest in this, um, some of the people interested in UFOs and crop circles began to think, ah, ah you know, what are these people up to? Uh, sorry, I don't mean these people. Um, they are the ones. Um, and Lynn's potential perceived links between UFOs and cold circles have been with us ever since. I mean, at its basic level, uh, in the mid 80s, in the early to mid 80s, in the simple circles, uh, people literally described these things as sources. They were aware of circular UFOs and contracts in the crops. And it was interesting to see the theories get more and more elaborate as the patterns got more and more elaborate. You could explain perhaps 
Nails. Well, my talk is called Forbidden Archaeology, actually. Uh, it's one aspect of forbidden knowledge. And what I'm talking about is archaeological evidence for extreme human antiquity. Today, most archaeologists would say that human beings like you or me came into existence only about 100 or 200,000 years ago. And they would say, before that, there were only more primitive, ape-like human ancestors. But when I did eight years of research into the whole history of archaeology, I found that's really not true. Archaeologists from all parts of the world have discovered many things in the form of human skeletons, human footprints, and human artifacts that go back tens of millions, even hundreds of millions of years. Now these things aren't very well known because of what I call a process of knowledge filtration. You know, only the discoveries that go along with the current theories are you going to see in the museums and in the textbooks. But there's a lot more to it than that. What's the oldest piece of physical evidence that's been discovered so far to suggest intelligence uh, quite a way back? So the oldest discoveries I found in my research come from South Africa. There, miners, in, in the, the western Transvaal region have found many round metallic objects. They're a few centimeters in diameter. The most interesting feature is the parallel grooves that go around the center of each object. And metallurgists who have examined them say they can't explain how they could have formed naturally in the layers of the earth, which means they had to have been made by someone with human-like intelligence. But they're found in layers of rock about two billion years old. There are also reports of human skeletons that have been found in layers of rock 300 million years old. Uh, that report comes from a scientific journal called The Geologist you know, from the year 1862. And this particular skeleton was found 30 meters deep in the ground and it was covered by a solid layer of rock that was unbroken that extended for hundreds of meters in all directions. So you can't say that this skeleton would have come down from some higher, more recent level. That's you know, one counter explanation that people will often have. Uh, there are also cases of human footprints and shoe prints having been found in layers of rock 500 million years old. Uh, there was a case reported in Scientific American of a beautiful metallic base that was found five meters deep in solid rock about 500 million years old. So you've got many discoveries like that from all parts very, of the world. Very, very strange discoveries as well. Yes. So yeah. kicking out the leaky theories then about Old Uvai Gorge, going back a lot further than that. Oh yes, absolutely. And even at Old Uvai Gorge itself, there have been uh, interesting discoveries. In the year 1913, a German scientist named Hans Reck found a human skeleton in Upper Bed 2 of Olduvai Gorge. The, the skeleton was exactly like that of a modern human being, not like any kind of ape man. And it was found in layers of rock over a million years old, which is very interesting because according to the current theories, humans like us didn't come into existence until about 100,000 years ago. So yes, there are many hundreds of these discoveries that contradict the current theories. You know, if there, if there are only a few of them, I mean, people could say, well, you've got one or two interesting cases, but most of the evidence supports the current theories. So we're not talking about just a few cases. You know, we're talking about literally hundreds of cases that contradict the current theories. You know, when I started my research, I thought I would do maybe eight days of research and write a little article about it and go on to something else. But I found those eight days turned into eight weeks. The eight weeks turned into 
eight months, the eight months turned into eight years because one case led to another. And in the end, you know, I wound up with enough material for a 900 page book. You know, that's forbidden archaeology. So we're not just talking about a few cases, but a whole lot of them. I can't wait to see you talk anyway. Thanks very much for talking to us. Great, Brian. Chambers of the Great Pyramid. Could you please tell us a little bit what that entails? My talk was about the Great Pyramid of Egypt. Um, I was arguing that there was much more to the Great Pyramid than uh, is commonly believed, that it was not simply a tomb and nothing but a tomb, but that it contains many secret passages and chambers which were perhaps used uh, to house sacred relics. And I was also arguing that the tomb of the king was not in the king's chamber high up in the monument, as is popularly believed, but was down underneath the monument, more in accordance with ancient Egyptian traditions. Do you think that could have been also been to stop grave robbers getting into the pyramids as well, to actually hide it deeper down? I think the Egyptians were very concerned about grave robbers from a very early date, therefore it was very important to conceal the tomb. However, I don't agree with Egyptologists. They believe that the higher chambers in the pyramid were built for that purpose, to avoid grave robbers. From my perspective, what I'm arguing is that the, the Egyptian religion uh, was not a cult of the sun, as Egyptologists believe, but a cult of creation, in which they celebrated the creation myth and put the creation myth at the centre of their religion. And from that perspective, to me, it is unacceptable that they would have built a chamber so high up inside a pyramid, because under the creation myth interpretation, the body of the king has to be buried in the ground in accordance with the creation myth and with the myth of the uh, dying and rising creator god. Is your view of creationism shown and symbolised in any other artefacts or things that have been discovered? Uh, in Egypt, uh, I think it's inherent in everything uh, that we discover in ancient Egypt. Uh, also, let me just say creationism, I mean, that word is used today in a different context, so when we're talking about create, crea when we're talking about creationism, we're talking about the Egyptian belief in how creation occurred. So as today we have our belief in the Big Bang as the origins of the universe, for the Egyptians they had their belief uh, that the Earth was actually at the centre of the universe, so it was a geocentric system, and they also believed in a cataclysm that brought the cosmos into be the beginning. Uh, that cataclysm was centred on the Earth, and from that cataclysm then the sky and the rest of the cosmos was brought into being. Speaking with the Egyptian authorities now to try and put on the agenda an exploration of a small cave underneath the pyramid called the Grotto. Uh, this cave has been neglected for the past few hundred years because Egyptologists have been so convinced by their assumption the king was buried up in the king's chamber and I'm trying to persuade them that actually the tomb was underneath the pyramid and might still be intact and it'll be a very simple exploration, it won't take long, in fact I know the people with the equipment to go out there next week and perform the necessary test to see if there is a, a secret passageway uh, close to this uh, cave called the Grotto and I believe, I hope to prove my theory that there is a network of caves underneath the Great Pyramid containing the intact tomb of the king. That would be a fascinating expedition, I wish you all the luck with that.
opportunity for him to go and work with God. Can you imagine what son of rich, red, velvet roses make when they talk to each other? Perceptions moving down. Understanding that there are things going on there. And we are so restricted in our five senses, we don't really understand what's going on with the world.
Grant, this is fully qualified navigator, so he tells me that's a good one. That's not written down. It's just not the it's not there. It's good. Get used to this. Next year, you know, I'm looking at this one as hours of meeting for this one. I think we were locked in when I told you about eight hours once. 